Monday. It's, um, gee, one o'clock rock. We have uh, Heather Kaluna here. She is a postdoc fellow uh, at HIGP, the Hawaii uh, Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. And she is into space weather. And that is exactly why we're calling this show Space Has Weather Too. Hi, Heather. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> it's good, now that you're here. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is this with weather and space? I mean, are you kidding? No, I'm not <laughs> kidding. I mean, weather on Earth, for the most part, is stuff that erodes surfaces, right? So if you leave something outside, even if it's just a pair of slippers, over time it starts to get dried, eroded, a little bit like gray, right? The colors change. Um, and so the same thing happens in space, but there's different processes that are responsible for it. So for example, um, I'm interested primarily in micrometeorite impacts. So there's basically- Would you say that again? Micrometeorite impacts. I haven't heard of that. Uh, we do not discuss that at my dinner table. Oh, wonderful. Keskasekasa. It's basically little dust particles flying through space okay. that impact um, different surfaces. Okay. And space weathering really is important only for those bodies that don't have an atmosphere. Basically, they don't have something to protect them from these particles. And so when you look at the night sky and you see a little shooting star, that's basically a little speck of dust entering our atmosphere. Ah. And so if I was on an asteroid, for example, I, I didn't have an atmosphere. That speck of dust would come straight through and hit me. And so what and that- it would hurt you. It would hurt me, yeah. just a little bit. Yeah. Um, of course, these objects get bigger in size and we see, you know- It would hurt more. <laughs> it would hurt a lot more. <laughs> but fortunately, those are <laughs> occur much less frequently. So, yeah, so space weathering, primarily what I study is this, these micrometeorite impacts. But there are other sources of space weathering, such as the solar wind. And so, are you familiar with the solar wind at all? No. So, <laughs> it might be a bit of a surprise, kind of like the wind we have here on Earth. You know, it's a flow of particles that are moving past you. The solar wind is a flow of particles that come out from the sun. And so, these happen to be charged particles like hydrogen and helium. And so, these particles, as they fly through space, can also impact surfaces that don't have atmospheres. And they also erode the surfaces over time. Like sandpaper. Kind of like sandpaper. Dig, dig a little a hole. Very fine very sandpaper. Fine, fine sandpaper. Yeah. Like sandblasting. Like sandblasting. But, uh, slower, though. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Oh, how interesting. So, um, you call it weather. That's a pretty loose connection, isn't it? I mean, uh, what does weather mean in the space context? It means solar wind. It, it means micrometer. Micrometeorite impact. Impact. What else? Um, well, that's, uh, those are the two major components for the most part. I mean, but you also have, you know, solar radiation. So you have sunlight hitting your surface. Three, that, then. Yeah, you have stuff baking, basically, in the sun. Yeah. So these things, these things, are, um, it's not constant. The, not the solar wind, not the micrometer impact, and, and uh, not the solar uh, radiation. They, 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 they change. Well, the solar wind and the solar radiation is pretty constant, right? So we're constantly receiving sunlight from the sun. It only gets dark on Earth because our, par our portion of the Earth rotates out of view of the sun. Uh -huh. um, but the, the sun is still shining. And so um, the solar wind is operating the same way like the radiation. It's constantly flowing out of the sun. You might have some bursts due to some activity on the sun. You might have an eruption on the surface of the sun that tri uh, sends out a uh, basically a large surplus of these particles. And so in that sense, you can get a flux or a variation in this, uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, these particles. The micrometeorites now, you're right, that does change. You know, that, that, that isn't constant. What, what, what changes the, the rate of uh, micro impacts. impact? Um, the impacts depend on where your object is. So if you look at the moon, for example, you have impacts you know, occurring every, I don't know, every 10 seconds, every okay. few minutes. Okay. But um, as you get to different parts of the solar system, so say you get further out towards Jupiter, you're going to have a different um, density of dust. There's not going to be necessarily as many particles. And so you won't have as many, um, your frequency of these impacts is going to be less. So your job, should you decide to accept, mm -hmm. <coughs> as a, 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 a space weather person, okay. researcher person, mm -hmm. scientist person, is to, is to find out what causes these changes, am I right? Or, or where you can find these phenomena 
um, and uh, uh, what what makes them happen here, not there, or happen this way, not that way? Is, tell yeah, me what it is. Yeah, um, basically, as my astronomy background takes me into observing. Um, asteroid surfaces. And so what I want to see is actually how these processes affect the surfaces over time. And so I look at young asteroids and I look at old asteroids and I see how do they change? How does this, the spectra of these asteroids change? So you're looking at the surface to see what, how they were beat up by these various phenomena. Mm -hmm. And then how it manifests in the colors or the spectra of the asteroid. And so are you familiar with a spectrum? No. I okay. assume I'm a carte blanche. Okay. Um, <laughs> A rainbow is essentially a spectrum. So mm -hmm. when you take white light and you shine it through a prism and it produces a rainbow, that rainbow is your spectrum. Except instead of recording on a telescope computer, it's recording on your eye, right? You see those colors yeah. and they're recording on your eye. But what you're, taking, what you're doing is you're taking that white light and you're splitting it into a bunch of different colors. So you're splitting it into its individual components. And so what I do is I study these colors of these asteroids and over time, what we see is that certain colors actually get affected more um, prominently than others as a result of space weathering. And what happens is, um, unfortunately, <laughs> this is where space weathering, there's a downside to it in the sense of um, we use spectra, so we use these colors to try to understand the compositions of asteroids, right? We can't send spacecraft there anytime we want. It's an expensive endeavor. Um, very but rarely have we been able to sample these asteroids. Yeah, they move fast and they, they have move fast. orbits that you don't know where they're going, I yeah, guess. Yeah, it gets pretty complicated. Yeah. And then it's even more so complicated to, say, land a spacecraft on an asteroid, collect a sample, and bring it back. Oh, that would be hard. That would it? be hard. And, Fortunately, and you would regret probably having tried. <laughs> there is one, uh, the Japanese actually um, have done this for right? an asteroid that was nearby Earth. A human person? Uh, not a human person. It was a nice robotic. Machine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no people necessary. But um, it successfully landed on the surface. Some dust on the surface got knocked into a, a little carrier that got delivered back to Earth. And so that's the only a asteroid we've ever directly sampled. So if you got the dust from the whatever the, the container was that the Japanese picked up off the asteroid, uh -huh. what would you do with the dust? What would you look for? How would you look at it? Right, so there's people who actually specialize in this, and this is a little outside of my field. But what I do is, um, aside from my observations of asteroids in the lab, I simulate these processes by using a laser, a pulse laser, that basically heats up and vaporizes whatever sample I put in you know, my lab. Could be a rock. It so is a rock. <laughs> it's okay. usually a ground up rock. Okay. So to simulate the dust that you see on the surfaces of the okay. asteroids. But what I'm trying to simulate is exactly what we find in these samples that the Japanese picked up. So we see these little melt blobs, right? They're basically regions where the little micrometeorite came in and hit the surface. The heat from that impact vaporized some material, and some of that material cools down and recondenses on the grain surrounding it. How can you tell the difference between the material that was vaporized and fell back down again and the material that was there in the first place? So you can actually, I mean, just looking at, um, there's really amazing instrumentation nowadays that can get you really down to a very fine scale. Basically, you can see, you know, things on the scale of the thickness of your hair. Okay. And so you get down to this detail, and you actually start to see things pop out. And I mean, it literally looks like a giant melt blob, like you like piled a big glob of glue on a melt grain. And yeah, it's like, yeah. okay, that's not a normal um, mineral So you structure. compare it against the, what you see in the background. Exactly. And it looks different, like a blob, maybe. Yeah. And then you start looking at that. So now you, you have your blob. Right. What do you do with the blob? So I should actually take a step back. Okay. Um, we know about space weathering actually from the Apollo missions. Oh, really? So the astronauts brought back samples from the moon. Okay. And these samples included rocks mm -hmm. and soils, mm -hmm. right? So some of this space or this lunar dust. And when you look at the lunar dust, you can actually see these same things, these, these melt blobs. We can also see, if you like cut one of these um, lunar soil grains in half, you actually see that there's a, a glassy rim around some of these grains. And within that glassy rim, there's nanometer-sized me metallic iron particles. And so this always. is... Not always. Um, but for the most part, you know, we see it pretty pervasively in the samples. Okay. Um, 
And so it's interesting because people wondered, all oh, right, you know, what is this that we're seeing? What's causing it? And part of what I'm investigating is whether or not, you know, it's the solar wind that isn't primarily responsible for producing these features, or it's these micrometeorite impacts. And so there's a big, big question about which one is the more dominant process. However, um, when, what's interesting is that if you look at these, uh, these soils, right, that were collected directly from the moon, and if you compare it to a soil that you make by grinding up a lunar rock. Sorry, I don't know the answer. Oh, that's so interesting. That's, that's our <laughs> echo machine. <laughs> she, you must, she must have said something that triggered her. <laughs> But uh, clearly, she didn't know the answer. She doesn't know the answer. That's really interesting. I did that to my phone recently, too. I don't know. Maybe so it's my funny. voice. <laughs> this is time for a break. We're going to take, okay. take a short break, and, and we're going to turn her off. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's uh, Heather Kaluna. She's a postdoc fellow at HIGP at UH Manoa, and she's studying, sp researching space weathering uh, at HIGP. This is Research at Manoa. Space weathering, space has weathering too. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. I hope you'll join me each Friday afternoon as we explore the amazing world of science. We bring on interesting guests, scientists from all walks of life, from all walks of science, to talk about the work they do, why they do it, and moreover, why it's interesting to you. What the science really means to your life, its impacts on you, how it's shaping the world around you, and why you should care about it. I do hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. for Lakeable Science. Looking to energize your Friday afternoon? Tune in to Stand the Energy Man at 12 noon. Aloha Friday here on Big Tech Hawaii. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Law Across the Sea. Please join me every other Monday to hear lawyers from Hawaii discussing ways to reach across the sea and help people and bring people together. Aloha. Okay, we're back on Research in Manoa, one o'clock block on uh, every Monday. And we have Heather Kaluna. She's a postdoc fellow at HIGP, the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, and talking to us about her research, which is space weathering. So, Heather, how did you get into this business? This is, I mean, did you wake up one morning and say, I like to study <laughs> space weathering? Um, well, really, it's an interesting question. I got into this business through my PhD program. And so, which was? Uh, astronomy. So I went to the Institute for Astronomy, which is our uh, master's and PhD program at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And when I first went there, my advisor, she's actually someone who we call an astrobiologist, have you heard of an astrobiologist? I, I have, but oh, I, never, I never did understand it, though. <laughs> it's basically an inter interdisciplinary sort of perspective on astronomy and life in the universe. Mm -hmm. And what she did when she, you know, I was trying to find an advisor, she spoke to me about this topic that I just, it just hit me, and it was so amazing. And the topic is the origin of Earth's water. And you might be thinking, how is this related to space weather? I am thinking that. <laughs> and I will get there. Um, but uh, what's really interesting is that we think that Earth formed so close to the sun that it actually was too warm for it to have its own water, and that water had to be delivered through impacts from comets and surprisingly wet asteroids. And so I got really interested in these wet asteroids. Because it was a mystery. It's a mystery. And I'm, you know, I'm born and raised on Big Island. I'm a water girl all the way, <laughs> grew up by the <laughs> beach. And so you know, really being able to study water in space was really fascinating to me. However, in order to characterize which asteroids have water on them, getting back to these spectral features or these colors and these fingerprints, um, if space weathering is removing and making some of these fingerprints disappear, that reduces our ability to detect these water-rich asteroids or characterize their water composition. So it's like the traces of what happened before washed yeah. away, like on the beach, the sand and uh, yes. the waves wash away you know, you the history of it. You slowly start to see the words disappear every yeah. time the wave comes up, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's why I got into space weathering. It's like, I'm really interested in this question of, you know, how much water did asteroids contribute to Earth's, you know, our oceans? And so, you know, in order to answer that, we first have to look at this question of space weathering. How does space weathering modify these features that we use to characterize the water and the water histories? Can, can I roll objects? it back for yeah. a minute, though? 
<clears throat> why do you say water? Water is so easy to make. All you need is hydrogen and oxygen. Mm -hmm. Why wasn't there hydrogen and oxygen here on Earth? And why right. wasn't there some sort of natural process, some kind of phys physical phenomenon that happened that put them together as water? Why does it have to be external delivery? Right. And so that has to do with the, um, the temperature, basically, right? So when you look at the inner planets, they're primarily rocky bodies, right? But as soon as you get out to, you know, the inner planets are like Mars, Mercury, Earth, Venus. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you get out to Jupiter, the, the game changes, right? You have a, suddenly a huge, massive planet that has actually a ton of hydrogen in it. And this has to do with the fact that um, there was a certain temperature in our solar system when it was forming. So when our planets were forming, there's a certain temperature away from where the star is forming, our sun is forming, basically in the center, where the temperatures get cool enough that water in that vapor, basically in the gas, that's a, our we call it the solar nebula, but water exists as a gas form um, close into the sun. And once you get to a certain distance, that vapor can actually turn into a solid and can turn into water ice. And so as little particles... Vapor particle is steam. We're talking about steam, right? Basically, yeah. 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 Okay. And so this vapor, once it becomes solid, can now become incorporated into these, we call them protoplanets. They're like little planetary... Um, embryos of a sort or um, eggs <laughs> yeah, okay. and so that's where it becomes important is because if you're too close to the star if you're too close to the sun you're only going to have solid materials that are hitting each other and sticking to each other right you're not going to have gases that just suddenly collide and clump together like we don't see that you know well, well, why why don't because the sun the sun will burn them off or the sun will the gravity of the sun will pull them in why, why are they not there? So the water is there in vapor form near Earth. But um, you can kind of think of it as like, you know, if you're outside and you're throwing around a bunch of pieces of mud, are you going to have the water and the air stick to the mud? Not necessarily, right? Mm -hmm. It's the mud that's going to be sticking to each other for the most yes, part. Yes, I see. And so that's essentially what's going on. I mean, that's <laughs> the best it's, analogy it's I can come up. It's a medium. It's a medium, right? Yeah. And so, basically, the inner planets only formed from the stuff that was solid. And most of the planets in the outer solar system, like Jupiter, Saturn, and whatnot, because they were able to form from a combination of ice and rocks, right, they got their cores built up very quickly, their, ma their gravity became so massive that they actually could steal some of the gas, the hydrogen gas that was around them. So that's why they have these giant gaseous envelopes. But Earth and the other planets in the inner solar system never got big enough to be able to like trap gases quite like that. So have you been developing a theory about how all the water actually got here, the delivery of the water? I mean, I, I can imagine these planets that's, that are largely water mm -hmm. somehow, and what they, they, come, they come down from heaven on, and splat, they're on <laughs> Earth. I mean, I've splashed the wrong sound. No, splat's great. I like splat. Because <laughs> that means it's a nice wet asteroid. <laughs> is that, I mean, do you have a theory about how this happened? So this is actually a little beyond what I do. Um, and that's where, you know, we have these big picture questions in science, right? So this is the end game. This is the, the gold medal. Once One day, hopefully, once we piece together all the little components that everyone's working on, we can actually answer that question. So I'm personally not trying to figure out, you know, how these asteroids got here. Um, there's people who s design models and try to you know, see like, if Jupiter and Saturn moved in our solar system as it was forming, how does that toss things around? And they look at that kind of thing. Oh. But instead, I'm looking at this, these uh, spectral features of these asteroids to see, like, given this knowledge of what we see today, can we trace back to what, we, um, what these objects were like when they first formed? So that way we can actually see, you know, these impacts that hit the Earth early when it was forming. How much water did they give us? Okay, so you know what, what's happening today because you, you can... You well, can I'm the, trying to figure out what's happening today. Uh, well, aside from the Japanese dust, mm -hmm. how else can you do spec, spec, spectral Spectrum. analysis mm -hmm. of um, what's going on on the asteroid? I mean, you can look so, at it through a telescope. Yeah. So I go up to Mauna Kea. Um, 
I've spent quite a few nights up there <laughs> sitting at the telescope, and I tell you, it makes you quite loopy up there, I swear. <laughs> oh, sure. When you get to it, I've been, I've been at Mauna Loa, mm -hmm. and I know how that works. Yeah, it's really there's weird a very feeling. subtle yeah. difference in elevation <laughs> there. Um, so, yeah, so um, I use the telescopes. We have special instruments that take the light coming in from an asteroid and make a spectrum out of it. So we have basically a prism inside the telescope that splits the light up. And we can start to search for those fingerprints that tell us that there's water-rich minerals on these asteroids, or there's water itself on the asteroid. Okay, so now you know the composition, which is complicated, of, of mm -hmm. an asteroid. <laughs> you know <clears throat> about the globs and everything um, on the asteroid. And you, you know, so you're learning the, the, the real-time real characteristics of, of, of the asteroid and the existence of the water on right. the asteroid. But how can you compare that against the way it was a long time ago? Mm -hmm. You can't see that anymore. Right. How do you know the way it was a long time ago? So this is where models come into play. And so that's why the observations are very important. Because in order to really, I mean, you can model anything, honestly, and say, hey, this is how it was. But if you don't have the observations to really give it some ground truth, you're not going to be able to say much. And so that's why these observations are important. Because if I can say, you know, these many asteroids have water on them, then they can start to say, okay, well, based on our model of the solar, early solar system and the temperatures and, you know, the amount of bodies that were in that region, they can say, this is how many objects we expected to impact the Earth based on our model. And so it really comes down to taking the observations and tying it into the models. So you're working it backward. Working it backwards. That's all we can do is work That's it what, backwards. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, we're talking about what? Millions of years ago? Millions, billions of billions. years ago. Billions. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is, this is pretty sophisticated stuff. Um, what, what, what kind of instrument? I mean, if I, if I go with you one morning to your laboratory in HIGP mm -hmm. um, and I walk in, what am I going to see there? Can you describe it for me? Yeah. Um, so you basically have <laughs> this long rectangular tube that actually houses a laser. And okay. so it's an infrared laser, and we can't actually see that with our eyes. Okay. And so if I was to turn it on, you wouldn't actually be able to see it, like, fire out of okay. the tube. It wouldn't hurt me, though. It would hurt you. Oh, sorry. It could zap you. So, Ooh. like, if we put a little piece of paper in front of it our laser, it. it goes zap. Okay. And so, you know, it won't, I don't think it would burn a hole <laughs> through your hand unless you just leave it there. <laughs> and so, yes, so you have this laser. It goes through. There's a couple lenses to help redirect the laser down onto our sample. Our sample itself actually sits in this chamber. It's this giant metal um, uh, round. This is, this it's almost like this, a ball. Okay, yeah. but it's only this big. Yeah, it's not very big. I mean, okay. our samples, we literally, you know, I use a half a gram okay. of powder okay. in our samples. Um, but we put it inside this chamber, and we shut the chamber, and we actually pump the air out of it. Okay. So we try to get it down to pressures that are close to what we see in space. So very, uh -huh. very low, very low vacuum type pressures. You're just trying to emulate the pressure in space. You're not getting, getting it down to zero. Exactly. Zero. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. And so, um, yeah, so we put our sample inside the chamber, close it, get the air out of there, and we turn on the laser, and it's pulsed, so it's meant to sort of speed up the impact process, right? So the impacts don't occur, you know, instantaneously and continuously like you're asking. But we also don't have time to sit here and uh, simulate it exactly according to the rate that happens in space. Yeah. So we speed up the process by pulsing the laser, right? Yeah. And so we do, you know, once every 20 seconds, or sorry, um, 20 pulses a second is how quickly we're actually bombarding our sample. Okay. And so we do that for whatever period of time we're interested in doing it for. Until lunch. Until lunch. <laughs> Usually <laughs> I'll do like a few minutes. Okay. Um, take it out of the chamber, and then I have a spectrometer. And so this is a thing that images, you know, it takes the light, splits it up, and it images uh, my sample. So I can actually see how these features vary. So, so you can see the, the elements of, from the periodic table, what's what, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that what this spectroscopy does? Yeah, but instead of elements, we're actually looking at minerals. So there's specific features that correspond okay. to minerals, like olivine and pyroxene. My favorite minerals, the ones that I'm interested in, are these clay minerals. So they're basically muddy clay minerals. Because there's water in there. Yeah, because there's <laughs> water in there. And um, we call them phyllosilicates. 
and really, honestly, as a graduate student coming from an astronomy background, this was a whole new ball game. Sure, yeah. Um, and uh, honestly, oh, there's some pictures. We had a picture a minute ago. Really? Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, all right. So, um, I just want to get. You know, we have a couple of minutes left. Okay. I just want to get where this fits. You spoke before. Um, there are some scientific leaders out there who have been thinking about the comprehensive mm -hmm. and where where all this fits, uh, what you're doing and others, um, and the, you know, sort of the look back on how it was mm -hmm. way back when, yeah. and how and and sort of to find lessons about how the universe works and how the the weather works and those three kinds of weather phenomena yeah. that you have. I mean, they become oh. important yeah. for asteroids. I mean, you know, when you talk about space travel, yeah. these processes are important. Understanding how do they affect people, much less, you know, asteroids, is an important thing to quantify. You mean if you're on an asteroid or if, if you're, you're on, on a planet, if you're on Mars, if for you're example. on the moon, you know, these kind of things. So it could be bad. You could have a solar storm and it would really give you a headache. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what about um, identifying asteroids coming in? That's not part of it, though? Um, not, that's not what I do, but there are people who do that. Yeah. And so, but that's, yeah, that's okay, what you Okay, so I'm, I'm Joe Blow, I'm walking down the street. Okay. How does your research affect me? And that's a hard one, I know. How does your research affect me? What, what, how are you thinking of me? And how should I be thinking of you in terms of the connection of science and our daily lives? Mm -hmm. I think there's two answers I could give to that. The first one comes back to this origin of water. You know, that's really water is essential for life. And so it's kind of getting back to our origin story from a scientific perspective. And I think that, you know, is important to anyone. You know, I think religion is a big thing because people care about their origins. And so I think that's why what I do is really important. Um, at least to me. Yeah. And the other answer is, you know, aside from our origins, it's also our future. Yeah. And so if we look at um, space travel and space flight, you know, there's a whole new group of people trying to, you know, SpaceX, all these groups that are trying to develop technologies to have more space travel. And what one of the possibilities that we can do is actually, um, well, this is a idea that is floating around out there and I think it's exciting. Floating is the operative yeah. word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the idea is to use asteroids with water on them that have these clay minerals to refuel. So say, you know, you're flying through space and you only had so much fuel to get you to, say, the moon. But there's an asteroid nearby that has water features on it and you can say, hey, look at this asteroid. I know there's water on it. I can stop by there, have my little contraption, whatever that's <laughs> for someone else's Get the to water out of it. Get the water out of it, refuel my uh, spacecraft, and then mosey on to wherever I want to go next. But it raises, I mean, that raises, maybe it's inherent in that question, but it raises, in my mind, another question. That is, you know, we're having problems with water already on this planet. Mm -hmm. And in the years to come, we'll probably have more yeah. profound problems with it. Um, and maybe, just maybe, we'll find out more about water and the origin of water. We'll find out how it got here in the first place. Maybe we'll find out how to get more of it. Is that part of what you're doing? Um, I've never thought about it like that, but that is an interesting perspective. Um, hopefully we never have to get to that point. <laughs> okay. But one of the things that does, um, one of the questions that does pop up in this research topic is, you know, is the water on the surface of the earth all the water there is, right? So we have oceans and there's, you know, a seafloor. But what about the water? Is there water trapped in our mantle? Is there water trapped in the magma, the lava that is beneath our, our the surface of our earth? And people think there is. And some people think there might be like five times our ocean's worth of water submerged in the magma. And we can learn about that from looking at space. Yeah. We can learn about water, which is an essential part of life. Yeah, it so all fits into that, that story. It's another piece of the puzzle. Yeah, another piece of the puzzle. Well, thank you for working on the puzzle for us. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for appreciating it. Come back and talk more about your studies and your research and your writing. This is uh, Heather Kaluta. She's a PhD in astronomy at uh, IFA. 
Now she's a postdoc fellow at HIGP uh, studying space weathering. What an interesting discussion. Thank you, Heather. I hope you enjoyed. <laughs> Thank you very much. Awesome. Aloha. Aloha. Mm -hmm.